Last week we were, uh, in terms of spiritual depth, we were kind of way up here. And we had the, the sweeper on stage, and we were trying to just remind people that Jesus is life and gives life, and apart from Jesus there is no life. And so we had a vacuum cleaner up here, and we took Jesus' parable, I am the vine, you're the branch, and we said, if we, we translated that modern today, we'd say, we are the vacuum cleaner, Jesus is the electricity. And we had a lot of fun with that. And, and I say that and bring that up to just let you know that today we're going to go way down here. And so if today you go, whew, that was really heavy. Just remember last week was pretty light. And so we're going to even it out a little bit. And here's what I want you to know. This is the point. You ready? At the core of Jesus' identity is the work of atonement on the cross. This sacrifice upon the cross makes him unique among all other false gods. And it is impossible to separate Jesus from the cross. Meaning it is impossible to separate who Jesus is, the identity of Jesus, from the message of Jesus' atoning work upon the cross. The Apostle Paul, remember, Paul is someone who didn't believe in Jesus at first as the Son of God. So Paul is someone who sat out actually to kill members of the church preaching the very message that Paul ends up preaching. And if you want to talk about someone who has a life experience that we should all look and go, wow, here's a guy who literally killed those proclaiming the message, then after an experience with Jesus believed. Now this is, this is the guy. He says this in 1 Corinthians uh, 18. Uh, chapter 1, he says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are being saved, it, it, not necessarily the cross, but the message of the cross, the work that took place upon the cross, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the intelligent of the intelligent I will frustrate. Jews demand a sign. Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach what? A single message, Paul says. We preach Christ crucified. There is nothing else to preach. So at the very core of everything the early church started on, at the very building blocks, the very center, the cornerstone, Paul will go on to say, of everything the church believes is this message that Christ was the Son of God crucified for our sins. He says this message is a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But those to whom God has called both Jews and Greek, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And then he does this lesser than, greater than biblical comparison. He says, for the foolishness of God, as if God has any foolishness in him, is wiser than the human wisdom. So he says, even if God was foolish, it's still wiser than anything you and I think. And he says, oh, and the weakness of God, as if God has any weakness, is actually stronger than any human strength. The message of the cross and Christ crucified is the core identity of who Jesus is. We're going to talk about Jesus crucified this week and Jesus resurrected next week. Because if we want to ask the question, who do you say I am? You cannot separate the identity of Jesus from these two pieces of reality. But our culture no longer wants to hear about the cross. Our culture no longer wants to hear about the atonement. Our culture no longer wants to hear words like ransom or the blood of Jesus. In fact, at one point in time, many of you grew up in churches, you sang a song. It went like this. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Today, our culture would rather sing it like this. What can erase my mistakes. I'm going to try harder next time. At the very core of everything that we understand and believe stands the issue of the cross. You may look at this and go, how do those lyrics get back to the cross? Let me show you why everything hinges on this. Because if we don't take seriously the concept or the problem of sin, we can't take serious the cross. Here's why we struggle with the cross. You ready? Because when I look at the cross, I have to acknowledge that either this is a historical fact and reality or somebody made it up. 
And anybody who studies history, anybody who wants to take serious anything, has to go eventually to the conclusion that this is real. This took place. Jesus did live. He did die upon the cross. In fact, no historian argues Jesus lived, he died on a cross, and was buried in a tomb. And then the tomb was empty. What the historians and those who want to argue about is how did the tomb get empty? But those are historical facts that nobody argues. So Jesus' work upon the cross. When I begin to stare at the cross, I must say, not only was this a historical fact, but then I got to go, well then, why? If the story that the Bible presents, the story that the Christian church has presented, the story that Jesus himself said, this is why I'm doing this, then I have to go, why would Jesus die? Why would God leave heaven? Why would God become human and die for us? And the minute I begin to do that, I have to wrestle with this word called sin. And the minute I do that, it's like I stare at the cross and the cross becomes a mirror. And my soul, my every part of me that I once thought was this beautiful playground, when I stare at the mirror of the cross, at the holiness of God, I recognize that my soul is actually a hazardous wasteland dump. As it reveals and discloses the very heart of everything that I am. And my inability to solve, listen to this, to solve the problem myself. And so the message of the cross is hard to take because, because it functions as a mirror saying there was a problem so big that God had to die to fix it. When I was a kid, we were poor. I mean, we weren't like dirt poor, but we were poor. I didn't know it as a kid. You know, you just grew up going, we never wanted anything. I didn't know it. And uh, we had a, 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 there were four boys and, and my sister, excuse me, three boys and my sister, you know, who might as well have been a boy because she was always hanging out with us and being beat up and would actually beat up other kids. But the way my family worked was we would go to the store and mom would come back with uh, juice. And I don't know if any of you grew up this way, but mom would come back with juice, and immediately this is what would happen. She would get a pitcher and fill it just a little bit halfway plus with water, and then take the juice and pour the juice in there. This then would be filled all the way, the rest of the way up with water, and then you could drink either one, out of the pitcher or the container. Not drinking out of the container, literally, though we did. You're not supposed to, right? And, and so you could drink either way. Now, again, we were poor, so this was a way of making the juice go farther, because let's face it, if you grew up in our house, this could disappear after one basketball game. Right, at the park, okay? So it, it wasn't odd for us to be drinking watered-down juice. To the point where, literally, today I can't drink full-strength juice. I never knew it growing up. There was a very few times where anybody served anything full-strength juice. In fact, grape juice, which I absolutely love, is so strong. I'm like, oh, I can't. When we do communion on Sundays, and even that little bit in that little tiny cup, I go, whew, man, there's a lot of flavor in that, dude. I don't know. I can handle that. I'm glad we only have one little cup today, right? I just, it's just this, I watered down juice was the life I grew up in. Tater and I have talked about this. Tater does the same thing. Apple juice, same thing. Orange juice. I get orange juice at home. I immediately take a cup. I fill it halfway with water. I pour this. My kids come to the house and they go to get the orange juice out and they stop and they go, hey dad, is this your orange juice that you've already filled with water or is this normal people orange juice? And I look at them and I'm thinking, I'm stretching it out. I'm making it go the way it goes. It's too strong the way it is. Why would you drink anything full strength like that? And they say, Dad, why do you water down the juice? I would like to suggest to you that I can't drink it today full strength. And our culture can't handle Jesus today as the gospel is presented. We have so watered down the message of Jesus, the identity of Jesus, the very deity of Jesus, that we no longer even recognize the authentic Jesus, the historic Jesus, the real Jesus presented to us in Scripture. Some argue that the historical Jesus didn't even exist. Some argue that 
Well, the Gospels have been changed through time and they've been added and, and, and subtracted. The redaction has taken place through time so much so that, that by the time we get to reading what you and I read today, I mean, none of it's real. One professor that I was watching on YouTube the other day, he stood up and said, you know, Jesus as a historical figure had amazing, wonderful teachings and he started to talk about the Beatitudes and the Golden Rule and in the very same breath said, but we can't really know anything about Jesus or his teachings because you can't trust Scripture. And I thought, <laughs> you just used Scripture to talk about what a great guy he was and in the very same breath talked about how we can't know anything about this great guy. So which is it? And yet this professor in a university has no problem living with the contradiction that takes place even in one breath. It's almost as if our culture with the watered-down Jesus has become a culture of religious buffets. You can go and pick what you want from any religion, put it all on your plate and have it there, and you can make up whatever you want. Or even Jesus. Like you just go and I'm like, this teaching of Jesus, this piece of Jesus, this piece of Jesus, and this is what I'm going to take instead of settling for this is the Jesus that is presented. And let's face it, if we get to choose to eat somewhere, we're all going to go somewhere where we get to pick what we want, not what's presented to us, right? Because they might put broccoli on the plate. And we all know that is evil. Right? Those tiny little aborted trees. It's an ethical issue for me. Thank you, Lucinda, for laughing. The rest of you, it's okay. You're going to hell. Jesus discloses the heart of the issue and says, you cannot mix me with other religions. You cannot mix me with anything else. In fact, other religions at their core are also exclusionary in saying that you can't mix or that you have to mix. What separates Jesus from every other world religion and every other leader is two things. One, he claimed to actually be God and then died for his creation. The cross is inseparable from the identity of Jesus. When we gather on Sunday morning, when you gather to pray before a meal, you celebrate the fact that you serve a God who died for you. No other belief system has such a story. Romans 3 says this, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through redemption that came by Jesus Christ. And so the question for us then is, if we're going to not have a watered down Jesus, again, we've got to go back and stare at the cross and say there was a God who died. If I'm going to stare at the cross and say there was a God who died, I've got to go, well, why did this God die? And when I get back to the third question then, it leads me to the problem of sin. You see, when the cross becomes more than a necklace or a piece of jewelry or a clamp of wood that is on our stage, it reminds us again of the mirror effect. I look into it and I recognize the depravity of my own soul. Jesus reveals that we have a problem that cannot be fixed, cured, or tamed apart from the work of atonement upon the cross. Many of you uh, are golf fans. I'm not a big golf fan, but there was an interview that Tiger Woods did a couple years ago, and he had a statement in the interview that I thought was absolutely powerful. And this was right when Tiger Woods kind of fell from glory, when it was revealed he had had all these affairs, and he had cheated on his wife, and it just kind of ruined everything. And one interviewer uh, asked Tiger Woods, he said, how did you lie to so many people for so long? How did you lie to so many people for so long? And I thought, I thought this was a brilliant moment of just absolute full awareness for Tiger Woods and for us as a culture and for us as individuals. This was his response to how did you lie to so many for so long? He said, because I started by lying to myself. Rabbi Zacharias was recently invited to uh, Ivy League schools to speak to the deans and the principals and the top educators and specifically those in the business side of the schools. 
And he said, I had one question for them at the end of my talk as we did kind of a Q&A. And he said this, he goes, why is it that our Ivy League schools where we teach in ethics classes that all morality and all ethics are relative? That right and wrong always shifts and moves. And your opinion may be that this is wrong, but it may not be this person's opinion. We have to respect each other. We have to tolerate. He says, why is it that when we teach that in our universities, we're at all surprised when these people become CEOs and embezzle millions of dollars? At what level are you able to hold anyone accountable if they're living out the very ethics and morals that you teach them. Last night I was with a group of, of friends and we were talking about our kids for a moment. And one of my good friends, Laura, she said, I, I took my son's phone and I, I did what every good parent should do. And I started looking through it and she said, I, I found a bunch of texts and a bunch of threads that, that they were just talking bad about other people and there were cuss words and there were just things that shouldn't be on the phone. She's got a long story about her son constantly being nervous and looking over her shoulder, as you can imagine any teenage boy who's got a phone and his mom stuff on it doesn't want mom seeing. And and she said, I, at first I was like kind of a little proud because he never responded to what was being said. But then she said, I at the same time I was like, you shouldn't even be hearing this or reading this. His response to his mom was, but mom, it's just words. I don't really pay attention. They're just words. You see, our culture has watered down the message of the cross in Jesus to the point where we don't even recognize the very asset of communication and what it says about us when what we speak is just words. Hold on, I'm going to take you somewhere. Just stay with me one more. But it's a disease... And to be fair, it's a disease. It's not just other people. And any time you as a pastor start talking about the ways you mess up, you're never supposed to talk about small ones. But, but I, I just want you to see how, how even as a pastor, I, I, little things that have no significant impact on life will mess up. You ready? The other day, someone called me, and I said, yeah, I'm five minutes out. I hung up the phone, and I thought, I'm not five minutes out. I'm at least ten. And I thought to myself, why did I tell them five minutes? It's not like it matters at the end of the day what I've said to them. Why would I dare be dishonest? Why would I say five when I know it's going to take me ten? But it is that sense of greed and pride and lust and selfishness and all that word that we call sin, which corrupts the human soul, that we would even deceive someone about something that's not even of value or significance. But no other religion calls it sin. And no other religion gives you the pathway out. The Buddhist and Hindu says, it's your karma, you'll live with it. The Islamic faith says, hopefully you can win the favor of Allah. And maybe you'll be taken care of. It is the message of the cross which says, something is broken and God came to fix it. Let me give you one more piece. Some of you may recognize the name Victor E. Frankel, an Australian neurologist and uh, psychiatrist as well as and this is most important a holocaust survivor he writes this about his experience and I, I, uh, it's a little bit long I put it on the screen for you but there's a really important piece I want you to catch here in just a moment okay you ready he says this if we present a man with a concept of man which is not true we may well corrupt him when we present a man as an autonomation of reflexes, as a mind machine, as a bundle of instincts, as a pawn that drives and reactions, as a mere product of instinct, hereditary and environment, we feed the nihilism to which modern man is in any case prone. Now what he's saying there, he's saying it looks simply, if we really fall into the trap of the atheist belief system, that all you are is a collection of molecules and particles that randomly came together and good luck to you, look what they produced. If that is what we teach and believe, the consequences are this. He says, I became acquainted with the last stage of corruption. This is where it leads. That belief system ultimately is capable of believing. 
and leading to. He says, I became acquainted with the last stage of corruption in my, get that, second concentration camp at Auschwitz. The gas chambers of Auschwitz were the ultimate consequence of a theory that, this is so huge, that man is nothing but a product of hereditary and environment, or as the Nazis like to say, blood and soil. I am absolutely convinced that the gas chambers of Auschwitz, Strebenka, and Medikin were ultimately prepared not in some ministry or other in Berlin, but rather at the desk and lecture halls of the nihilistic scientists and philosophers. You see that phrase where he says? The consequence of theory is that man is nothing. We have become dehumanized. If you change the definition of a human you change the definition of what sin is, you lose yourself permanently. The Greeks looked at the cross and said it's offensive. Those whom Paul is preaching the message to looked at it and said, I don't understand. Ultimately, the message of the cross is to a group of people who have so disgraced, disfigured, and polluted the image of God. This is what it took to save you. At the core of our longing to reject the cross is the reality that I can't save myself. And oh, it irritates me. Does it irritate you? Because I don't like not being able to do it on my own. I want to fix it on my own. I want to get there on my own. I want to be in charge. The core message of the cross is you couldn't do it on your own. The problem was so big you had so dehumanized yourself. So distorted the image of God that God created you with. This was what it took to fix it. Don't miss that. Don't miss this either. That it is weird. That it is confusing. That it should jolt us a little bit. It's the same concept that here's the Titanic. It's sinking. People are stranded in the water crying for help. And a captain miraculously shows up. in a whole different boat that's able to hold all the people. And he steps out on the megaphone and says, I'm here to save you. I'm going to save you by first sinking my ship. <laughs> Which is really the message of the cross. I'm here to rescue you from the plight you're in. Oh, great. How are you going to do that? Jesus, you're going to conquer. You're going to destroy the evil. You're going to bring down fire and swords. You're going to annihilate everybody who does wrong things. No, I'm going to sink my ship. I'm going to die first. Paul wrote in the Corinthians that Jesus died for our sins. The cross was not an afterthought on God's part, but a plan from the beginning. Remember, we talked about what it means to once again make human. We have become dehumanized with the pollutants, with all the sin that has contaminated us. I want to read to you just a little bit. John R. W. Stott, one of the great uh, historians of our time, wrote a book called The Cross of Christ. I want to describe for you the price that was paid. Because I think, again, if we're going to water down our culture, we don't want to talk about the blood of Jesus, and the cross becomes a, a, a piece of jewelry that we wear. Stott writes this small paragraph which jolts us back into going... There was a huge price that God paid. And who did Jesus die for? Jesus died for me. That should be your answer. Let me describe to you the cross. He says, Crucifixion seems to have been invented by the barbarians on the edge of the known world. The Persians then took it over, and then next it was taken over from them by both the Greeks and the Romans. It's probably the most cruel method of execution ever practiced, for it deliberately delays death until maximum torture has been inflicted. The victims could suffer for days before dying. 
When the Romans adopted it, they reserved it for criminals convicted of murder, rebellion, armed robbery, provided that they were also slaves, foreigners, and listen to this, and other non-persons. You could only die on the cross if the Roman culture believed you were no longer human to begin with, a non-person. He goes on the right, but the torture of the cross was so agonizing that victims who had hung on the cross for days would beg passers-by to kill them. But they were unable to kill themselves because of the human instinct for survival. And therefore, victims would hang in torture upon the cross until their legs were broken or their body completely gave out. Our culture likes a watered-down Jesus. It likes a Jesus that almost looks like mud. And you can mix and pick any part of Jesus. And, and Jesus has all these wonderful teachings. But we don't want to talk about the cross. In fact, as a church, I hope not much of this message is brand new to you. But I hope you're going, man, do we need to reaffirm what is at the core of our story? Because here's what I think happens in our culture. I think that we've not always done a great job of influencing our culture, but rather we've let the culture slowly influence our belief system until we no longer, even as the church, the very vessel which Jesus said, you're to carry on the message. Have the pure strength, Jesus. Even we teach a watered-down Jesus. And let's face it. I mean... The message of the cross is offensive. And I don't want to offend anybody, do you? We want to be the people who are tolerant and caring. And so the challenge for us then becomes, how do we take a non-watered-down Jesus to a culture that's used to this? We can hide and not share the message. But the mission of the church is to what? If you said move people closer to Jesus, you get a free straw at Taco Bell with that. Right? If you didn't, it's okay. Next week we'll ask it again. The mission of the church is to move people closer to Jesus. To remain silent is to fall into the trap that Jesus warns us about. He says, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose their soul or to forfeit their soul, he says. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world but to forfeit their soul? How do we present the non-watered-down version of Jesus? And what impact should it have on our lives that the world can go, your love for Jesus is so powerful, it makes you behave, as Paul says, a fool. I like the story of Father Damien. You may know this story. Father Damien was born January 1840 and died 1889. Father Damien, as a young individual in the priesthood for the Catholic Church, felt a call to go to that place you and I would all go, yes, that's where I want God to send me, Hawaii. The problem was, in the late 1800s, Hawaii wasn't the vacation center that you and I know it today. It was still kind of a rough and barbaric land with the native tribes, and, and, and not sure what all was going on at all times. And Father Damien believed that God wanted him to go there. The problem was, is that he was not yet a priest. He hadn't graduated. And so the position that was open went to another man who became ill. And then went to his brother who became ill. And eventually, under a weird course of circumstances, Father Damien won the opportunity to go to Hawaii. He worked there eight years, ministering to the locals and inhabitants of Hawaii. And he said, over those eight years, something weird was happening. I began to notice that ships would come in carrying injured, harmed people. And then we would load people who were disfigured and harmed onto that boat, and it would disappear and never return. It would come back empty. He goes, I was teaching everybody about Jesus, about the love of God, and then I began to wonder, what happens to those people? And the closer he watched, the more he noticed that the people getting on the boat, many of them didn't have any limbs or 
didn't have any fingers, had nubs at the end of their arms, were missing ears, had terrible disfigurement. And he began to research and ask the government and the people in charge questions. And he found out that they take the people in that boat to the other side of the island. And between the two, there's this giant cliff. And the people on this side can't get to the people over here. And the people that they were transporting had a disease called leprosy. Or Hanskin's disease. He began to have a wrestling with God at that moment. Who was caring for those people that no one cared for? He would hear stories from the soldiers who were transporting of children who had been conceived on that island who were being raped and of people starving to death of people being murdered of terrible atrocities taking place and he began to ask the question who cares for the non-humans over there? Eventually, through a long course, he got permission to go to Hawaii, to the other side of the island himself. And he was shocked and appalled by what he saw. The government would regularly send in seed supplies so that they could grow their own crops. But because many of them no longer had fingers or the ability to use their limbs due to leprosy, they were unable to dig and plant the crops. Those who were were often taken advantage of and chaos reigned. It was an island of ill repute, of desolation, of starvation, and of mutilation. He began to fix all that. He began by reminding people of their value. That they have a God who valued them so much that he said, I will trade my life for you. And suddenly when people began to be reminded of their worth and the price that was paid for them, things began to change. He pleaded for the government with supplies, took boat trips all over the world begging people to send money and including the Pope himself. Years after working there, after starting every sermon that he preached on Sunday morning with this phrase, my fellow believers. One Friday night, Father Damien was preparing water to boil and treat one of the individuals who was infected when he spilt some on his foot and realized he didn't feel a thing. Now, I don't recommend this to anybody, but Father Damon took a cup, dipped it into the boiling water, and poured it onto his other leg, because that's the way to test this, right? And when he didn't feel anything in that leg, he knew that he too had contracted the disease, which he was fully aware of. This would be his end when he went to the island. That Sunday morning, he stands up in his pulpit and for the first time changes how he addresses the congregation and how he would address that congregation for the next several years before he himself passed away. He stood up that Sunday morning and it was no longer my fellow believers, but it was my fellow lepers. The message of the cross is that we and our souls have become so disfigured. This was the price that was paid to restore the humanity, the image of God within us. The incarnation is Jesus' moment where he says, My fellow sinners, I have identified with you upon the cross. I have taken your sin. That which disfigured you, that which deluded, polluted, destroyed you, I have now cured through my blood. Hebrews 9.15 says, For the reason Christ is the mediator of the new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to set us free from sin. Who is Jesus? Who do you say that I am? The identity of Jesus cannot be known apart from the work of atonement. The ransom paid for us on the cross. We're going to do something a little different here, but I want to pray to close out this message. 
Jesus. May we identify the watered down parts of our own theology. Where we've allowed other belief systems and other smorgasbord pieces to come onto our plate. And may Father, we, we stop and go, the cross. This is at the center of everything we are. And then help us to share that message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So here's a uh, thought I had. I finished all the message. And uh, this is how I work. My brain is extremely practical. In fact, if I can't understand why it matters, I, I jettison it out of my head. I'm like, there's enough stuff that matter in here. <laughs> and that's because I have a small, tiny brain. So I'm okay with that. Many of you don't have the problems I do. But I, I, here's what I, I, I got done with the message. and went, yes, the, the cross, the center. Everybody's, we should be able to grab that. And if I've done a good job, everybody goes, yep, let's not water down our faith. Let's preach Jesus and Jesus crucified. It is, it is unique. It is, it, you can't mix Jesus with anything else. And then what? Like the mission of the church is to move people closer to Jesus. So what do I do with this message besides the fact that, yes, I'm affirmed, but I already kind of believe that. And uh, well, if I'm going to really do a good job in helping us fulfill the mission and the message of the church, the mission of the church to move people closer to Jesus, I ought to then close by actually giving you some tools to put in your bag to go help move people closer to Jesus with this message. Not only should we be able to now walk out and go, actually that's a little watered down. We ought to be able to walk out and go, and let me help you this way. Now here's what I don't want. I don't think any of us should ever be crazy Jesus shouting at people, angry guy. That isn't helpful. That's a terrible approach to evangelism. Just shouting on the preach, you're going to hell. Do you know what's going to happen to you? That's scary stuff, right? That's not even Jesus at all. Jesus never did that. He never said, go shout at people and tell them they're going to hell. That's not how Jesus did it, right? Instead, I like this approach. If our goal is to move people closer to Jesus, we call it the pebble in the shoe approach. Any of you ever tried to walk along with a, like a rock or a pebble in your shoe? The other day I was in the barn and I was feeding the animals and, and I got something in my boot, which is always fascinating to me because my, my pants come over the top of the boots. And I'm always like, how did that get in there? Like, it's got to go like up the pant leg and down. The, I don't know how it happens, right? And so I'm walking all of a sudden I'm like, oh. And my thought was, you know what? I'm feeding this last animal. I'll go up to the house where I can sit in a chair and it's nice and clean. I'll dump out my boot up there. I took about four steps and my brain said, you are getting that out now. Right? That's how that works, right? And I sat down and I dumped it out. But here, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about this. This is hopefully absolutely freeing. When I came upon this concept, it was so freeing to me. Your job as a church, there's a reason we say move people closer to Jesus. It isn't to lead them to the cross and get them to say the sinner's prayer and have this conversion moment. That's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is simply to move people closer to Jesus. The way to do that often isn't to have all the answers because nobody cares about the answers until they know enough to ask the question. The way to do that is to ask the right questions. And so we say, if you ask the right questions, you're actually putting a pebble in somebody's shoe. You are making them go, my belief system is now irritated. I don't like this anymore. I need to stop and examine what's in my belief system, what's in my shoe. So here's what I want to do. I want to give you uh, just a couple thoughts as to do that. And again, I think the best way, the way it's modeled by Jesus, the way that uh, we see work in evangelism all over the world right now, is by asking the right questions. Because we say the stupidest stuff. And we don't recognize that we say the stupidest stuff. Why? Because we have dehumanized everybody, including ourselves. And therefore, when we dehumanize, we don't want to look at the cross because what? It's a mirror. It reflects like, oh my gosh, I'm polluted. I'm distorted. The image of God is no longer in me. And so I don't want to have anything to do with it. And I want to live where everybody's dehumanized. The cross is that moment where Jesus says, you were worth this much. Therefore, everything changes. Right? So here's just a couple phrases that somebody might say. Something similar. And I just want to give you some... Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's a great idea. Put a pebble in someone's shoe right there. You ready? Someone might say, this one's really easy, and we see this on the bumper stickers. I, I hear this on a regular basis. There's no difference between any of the religions. They may say there's no difference between Jesus and Buddha. Or all religions are really the same. Now, here's why we don't ask. We don't go any further because, you know, we could sit down and tell them about Jesus, but we're afraid they're going to ask the questions that we don't have answers to. Or we're afraid we're going to offend. 
And here's what I want to do. I just want to give you permission and encourage you by the power of the Holy Spirit to ask this simple question. What do you mean by that? Now see, that's really not that offensive. I'm, I'm asking you what you mean by what you say. I haven't talked about Jesus at all. I haven't revealed to you anything about where I think the answer should be. I just simply, you made a statement that is often made without thought in our culture. All religions are the same. Which is absolutely absurd because no religion is the same. They're all exclusionary of every other one. And when someone says all religions are the same, I just want to give you permission as someone who believes that the cross and Jesus Christ is the absolute center of everything to ask the question, what do you mean by that? You see, you didn't lead them to Jesus. You don't even have to ask another question. You're just putting a pebble on their shoe because if someone really stops and thinks about that, the logic becomes... A problem in a hurry. Reason fails. Because anybody who knows anything about these religions begins to immediately go, oh, you're right, they're not all the same. You see, you didn't, you didn't have the pressure of, i got to lead them to Jesus. All you did was put a pebble in their shoe and go, well, what do you mean that all religions are the same? Well, that's what I heard. Now, again, if someone gives you some flippant answer like that, you go, well, have you studied them at all? That may be the end of your conversation, depending on the interaction. If the person becomes a little violent, a little belligerent, a little like, hey, I don't care, I don't like where the question's going, you can stop. Or, again, maybe they want to now engage. Maybe it's a day later where they come back and go, you know, you asked me a question, and I've been thinking about it, and I realize that I haven't thought much about this. What do you think? <gasps> You're like, Jesus, open door! Touchdown! Here we go, Jesus, hand me the ball, hand me the ball, hand me the ball, Jesus, hand me the ball! All you did to start all that was ask a question. I give you permission by the power of the Holy Spirit to ask the question, what do you mean? Number two, the way this works, number two, we hear this a lot in our culture. Uh, it is an idea, it's just ambivalence to everything, right? Because when you dehumanize and when you become dehumanized, nothing else matters, right? And I can't tell you how often we hear this from our TJ, teenagers. It doesn't what? My gosh, you guys knew the answer. You must hang out with teenagers too. Right? It doesn't matter. Or nothing matters. Or what she said, it doesn't matter. What he said, it doesn't matter. Yeah, on my Facebook post, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what they said about me. There's a deep wound because this person hurt me and said these terrible things, but it doesn't matter. You ready? Here's the question. Ready? Why doesn't it matter? You're like a genius with these questions. I know, they're so difficult. I, you know, you're like, ah. But here's a ch Just ask your kid, why doesn't it matter? I bet they don't have an answer. I bet this was, ah. You see, again, if they begin to say, well, it doesn't matter, they're going to have to eventually go down a road that says, because we don't have value. But if they pause enough to recognize that, no, that did hurt, and it does matter, the reason it matters is because we have value. And if there's another question you can ask, then you can go, well, why do we have value? Why, does their, why is it that their words, what they say, why does that matter? And eventually, if you trail that far enough, you're going to have to get back to, because God said we have value because Jesus died to restore our humanity, the image of God that we were created in. Value is at the core of it doesn't matter. Because to say nothing matters, it doesn't matter, what she said doesn't matter, means that I've eliminated the value that I see in myself and in others. The last one. You ready? We have become a culture that worships tolerance. And by worshiping tolerance, we can water everything down so that nothing ever offends or hurts. But what happens when tolerance actually becomes the wrong thing that's anti-helpful? Like watered down grape juice is okay, right? I mean, you may not like it, but it's just a preference. But if I watered down your medication, hmm, that's a problem. If I watered down one of your core values at your house, that becomes a problem. 
What happens when we water down the very thing that saves us? Because we worship tolerance. So when someone says to you, you're just being intolerant. You're just, you're, just, you're old fashioned, you don't get it. You want to play a little game. You know, tolerance sounds good. If you said to me in 2017, Ohio State won the championship game for football, and I said to you, no, no, they didn't. I mean, I wish they would have, but no, no, they didn't. Your response to me that says, you're just being intolerant, doesn't work anymore, does it? And then if I said to you, well, let me ask you this. If I came upon a group who was gang raping a young lady, and I approached them and said, hey, we should probably stop because this behavior is not acceptable. Would I be okay when the person turns to me and goes, you're just being intolerant of our views? No, I would not be. Nor would that make any sense at all. And so tolerance isn't a God. It isn't the goal. It isn't the objective. In fact, it is more harmful often than anything else. I want to be tolerant in that it's okay for you to have your set of beliefs and I don't have to treat you poorly. But that doesn't mean that I have to accept that your beliefs are correct or right or wrong. And so I want to push the envelope. I want to put a pebble in your shoe and go, why is tolerance so much more important than right or wrong? Because if you want to be tolerant, why are we sending kids to school teaching them two plus two is four? Why not let them believe whatever they want? So we really don't believe tolerance is the goal until it becomes a religious view. And if religion and your eternal destiny is so important, why is it then that it's the goal? Everybody on board? You don't have to wear the pressure that says, I've got to lead people to Jesus. Your goal is, how do I put a pebble in that person's shoe by asking the right question? I don't need to offend. I don't even need to ask a second question. If I see it's like, hey, that's all they can handle. Some people can only walk around with one pebble in their shoe. Some people, you're like, yeah, I'm going to load this up. Right? How do I ask the right question to eventually get back to the message that Jesus Christ and the cross are the core of everything that makes us human? We're going to invite the band to come up. And I've asked them to play this song. I've asked them to play this song. I stand amazed in the presence. Guys, can you flip up the, uh, the lyrics there? Uh, the reason I said, hey, let's do the song, Meg, and she said, okay, good. Uh, go, to the, go to the chorus, please. It's because uh, I just love the idea that when we stop and we stare at the cross, when I stop and stare at the price that was paid to restore and regain my humanity, my image of God, I have trouble but singing anything other than how great thou art. Or as this song says, how marvelous, how wonderful. And this is my song, and it shall ever be. Because my God died on the cross for me. At stake today is the very core of the message that we preach and teach. That Jesus lived and he died for our sins. Don't water it down, church. May we pass it on to our children and grandchildren. May we carry it appropriately into the culture that loves the watered down Jesus. May we speak truth at all times. May we be the message. In the name of God the Father Almighty, go and ask the right questions, throwing pebbles in people's shoes, proclaiming Jesus is the Son of God who lived and died for my sins. Amen.